Wonderful. So um, today, we're like I mentioned, we're going to start off with our reimagining education and future of work. Uh, we are pleased to also welcome us today. We are hosting this event in Canada, and it would be wonderful to have, obviously, some representation from our host country. So I'm pleased to be joined by um, Honorable Stephen Luce, who's going to be speaking um, and giving remarks. He's our Minister of Education for here in Ontario. So thank you for joining us, Minister. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's good to be here. Good morning, everyone. Good morning to the world and all those watching. Uh, I just wanted to provide some very brief commentary, and then I'll leave it over to our subject experts to carry on the discussion. Uh, I am. Uh, my name is Stephen Lecce. I was appointed Ontario's Minister of Education in June. I perhaps do not look like your average politician, both domestically or globally. I'm the youngest education minister in the country, in the province's history, I believe, in the country's history. That in itself is not a metric of success. I think. You know, the value proposition we bring to the table as generational leaders is really what uh, I think we should benchmark. But I think it is good that in government across party lines, uh, this is a manifestation we're seeing left and right, that younger generational voices are stepping up to the, to the, to the table uh, to really drive positive change, both for our generation and for the next generation. That's a good phenomena. In the provincial parliament, we have the most, um, in, our, in our caucus, that we have 13 millennials elected. Uh, a few of them are in the cabinet. We have the most women elected, the first Muslim elected in our party's history, uh, the first Tamils elected in Canadian history of any parliament, first Armenians, uh, and, uh, and the first Egyptian, first Coptic Christian, so many firsts. And that's not unique to one party. I think that's a demonstration of the diversity that is uh, rising within governments and parliaments across the world. And we need to see more of that, I think, if we want to see... Um, uh, the change we seek in the world. And today, you know, we're talking about, in many respects, the future of work. And in this country, we face, and province, a stubbornly high youth unemployment rate. And some people would submit, you know, the cause of that is um, policymakers over several generations not really considering the impacts on younger people. And that there may be some truth to that. That probably is a, a comment on all parties, actually, including you know, uh, governments past and present. But I think the fact that there are younger voices at the table is helping. And I wanted to talk about a few of the areas of economic opportunity. You know, my parents came to this country seeking economic opportunity, like many of you or your parents or grandparents or great-grandparents. At one point, uh, other than our first peoples, we were all immigrants to this country. And I think that vertical growth, that opportunity society they came here seeking, where if you work hard, you know, you're committed to your community, you love your country, uh, you know, you're a disciplined person, you, you know, and um, exercise good judgments and commitment, you should be able to get ahead. And I think for the first time generationally, you look at the economic models out there, it's the first time in our country's history where the next generation, this generation, younger generation, is disproportionately, uh, faces disproportionate fiscal challenges than the one before them. And some would submit they are, there's a bit of, their communities in peril. Uh, for seeking employment, access to good jobs, the sustainability of jobs, and uh, conversely, the ability to own a home. These are all aspirations our parents were able to achieve, and some would su suggest our generation, your generation, may not uh, be able to achieve. And so, while that probably is an accurate statement today, I think it's a bit of a you know pessimistic outlook if we accept that as the status quo. And I think for us today, and for people around the world, it is to um, you know challenge that assumption and take action today swiftly to remediate it and change the trajectory so that young people can get ahead and seek uh, the income mobility they deserve. And so a few things I want to talk about in the context of that changing landscape, of course, the first, and I've got a, a few interesting data points here, one of which is just from a changing work landscape, the disruption of AI and how that, for many economists would submit, it can displace jobs, but conversely, it also has the opportunity to create a value-added jobs in our economy. And we want to make sure that we are looking ahead. You know, 50% of all work uh, that could be, currently, could be automated, according to technologies that exist. McKinsey put out a report where roughly 5% of the market today is automated. But up to 50% of jobs in the world could be automated based on current technologies. And so the point is we have to, as policymakers and as young people in the job market, be ready for that uh, trajectory and for that shift and make sure that we're incenting industries to grow and ecosystems to grow within our province and our country uh, to support new technological jobs, which is why STEM is so important. I know prior to you've mentioned 
is you know, uh, the idea of young women in STEM and the skilled trades. And for me, that is a personal priority. I think you know, it, is, it is incumbent on all policymakers of all you know, men and women, urban rule of, all, of us all to accept the premise that we need to see more labor, labor market participation from women, particularly in STEM, where they're disproportionately lower. There's a, a, an interesting graduation rate. With, with that in mind, if yeah. I could just interact for a minute, um, what could be, in your opinion, um, an action or a solution that we could look at, like a strategy to approach some of these gaps? Yeah, I, I mean, uh, well, with respect to STEM specifically, I think the single greatest thing we can do is ensure that governments, academia, and the private sector is working very hard to incent more women to participate and to see more women leaders so that young women in the classroom could see themselves. And I think we need to really be profiling success stories in this country, made in Canada success stories of strong uh, innovations that are coming from this economy, from this country. And I think the more we can do that, the more we can champion that labor market participation, the more we're going to see young women uh, enter the market. So creating more visibility, essentially, yeah. for the ones who are already doing it and um, helping to similarly, I guess, pave that pathway. Um, I guess that could apply also externally as well to other countries as well, just in general, kind of championing um, those individuals who are trailblazing their own path, it seems, at some point, because it's a little harder to go out. <laughs> Thank you. Continue. <laughs> Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think this is a global phenomena. You're right, it's not just a Canadian challenge. But I think if we work together, especially amongst industrialized economies, we will help encourage more participation of women in the economy, especially in the developing world where that's so fundamental to the prosperity of those regions. Another interesting element is just the importance um, of math. The World Bank reported said between now and 2020, math will be the single greatest driver as a competence that the private sector is looking for. And so in this country, knowing that you if getting ahead of the question, what can be done is to have long-term investments in numeracy and financial literacy to enable generational people in government as well as in private enterprise, in the public sector, in, in the startup economy, and in the social uh, economy, all of us to have greater strengths in that area. And I think if we look at the vulnerabilities from a competence perspective, you know, in this province and country, we, we have a very industrialized, skilled workforce. We're very proud of our system. We're proud of our educators. And we're proud of our students, who I think work hard. But we also are self-aware, and I think we're confident as a country to acknowledge we've got to do some, some things better. And one of those is in math and financial literacy. I think it's foundational for the prosperity of this country that we have to better strengthen numeracy skills starting in the most elementary years. And so that is a reality for many economies. It certainly is in this province. And so we've taken, we have a four-year, $200 million strategy that really looks at changing from a pedagogical perspective how we teach young people, but also what we're teaching them. Uh, and going so back to basics in many respects to sort of encourage uh, those skills and to apply them. I think a third element of uh, when it comes to that, applying these theoretical principles of more math is making it more hands-on, more experiential. Um, you know, less theoretics, if you will, and more practical learning. And I think for a lot of us, for a lot of you who've gone through the education system, you know, you, we appreciate that the theoretical knowledge we learn in the classroom, but we seek uh, practicum. We want to apply it. And for the first time in my minute, in, 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 I mean, I've only been doing this for, you know, 70 odd days, but in the first weeks of my ministry, I announced an updated careers course. Now, just out of curiosity, how many people have taken the grade 10 careers and civics courses in the province of Ontario. Just give me a raise of hand if you've done it. Okay, so it gives me a good context. So you will know this is the ultimate bird course in the province of Ontario. Um, I'm sure you all- in other countries too. And in other Definitely, countries. Yeah, just a different name. <laughs> yes, I'm hoping it's not a bird course there, but if it is, maybe it's a, there's a mandate to change it. But when I saw that, I recognized there's a need to strengthen the learning uh, that comes out of that. And for the first time, for a student in September this year, uh, you will, a student will have to graduate as a condition, building a budget for the first year after high school. Be it if they go to you know, the apprenticeship program, college, university, right into the labor market, that's their choice. But what is now foundational is to have that personal budget. So it's things like that that I think are gonna really change the dynamics of how young people think and how they work. What is your perspective on STEM versus STEAM? Because um, when we look at STEM, we look at math and science and technology, but there's a growing need also, especially with the automation, there's this whole other conversation on the fact that the one thing that humans have as an advantage to robotics is the creativity, the, 
creative thinking. And I see this even working um, with, we have a tech startup and I work, we have a team of developers and I see this applying even to their lives when they're doing design thinking. And that takes creativity in the A of STEAM, of arts. So what's your perspective on that? Yeah, no, I, look, I think the STEAM is uh, an inclusive term that really focuses on sort of all the competencies, soft skills and otherwise. You know, I often say STEM only because I think in this province and country broadly, we do a pretty good job at um, uh, when it comes to the art, artistic sector, the creative sector, and the, stimulating the mind from a cognitive perspective using art and music uh, and other courses to do that. Where I think we need to emphasize more, where we have sort of an area of vulnerability is how we encourage more young people, particularly women, where the differential of gender is so profound. Engineering is a great example where you have such a higher significantly disproportionately higher level of males versus females. So what, the reason why I often talk about STEM is not to discount the importance of the arts. I'm a, I took music and trombone in high school. Uh, you know, I'm not gonna comment on my finger painting skills. My nieces are profoundly better than I am. But the point is, I value those sectors and I value the creative industries in this country. They're a major employer of jobs in the country, multi-billion dollar uh, advantage to our GDP. My point simply is where our country needs to emphasize more on vis-a-vis -vis what we do well, what we don't do well, is those science, technology, engineering, and math as core competencies. But you're right, the arts are important, particularly when it comes to the you know, collegiality, when it comes to uh, creative elements, when it comes to uh, collaboration and communication skills, being able to emotively communicate your thoughts and, your, um, and um, articulate your values. That is important. I would argue it's, it's the one currency that's increasingly in demand in the labor market. And that's what I hear from, from employers all the time. But I think we got to continue to focus on STEM as a, as a competence in the classroom. And together, that'll make sure that Canadians and young people, wherever they work, wherever they live, have um, access to a better paying job. I, I agree. I think uh, it really comes down to more integration rather one or the other. I think really the challenge is, to your point, isn't so much of emphasizing um, STEM versus arts, because you're right, there's lots of music programs and things. Where I see the gap is the ones who are in the music programs and the creative programs are not taking coding, and the ones who are coding are not taking the creative courses, rightfully so, because they're focused on their craft. But the design thinking and that mindset can be applied to their field and add a new lens, I guess, asset to their career. Yeah, and I think you're right. It's not an either-or proposition, and I think that's a good way of phrasing it. You know, McKinsey did a report um, recently in the context of those skills, and are young people prepared for the jobs of today and tomorrow? Uh, and 66% of employers told McKinsey that the answer was no. And part of it in the study was, that corroborates this point, is a lack of the balance of sort of those hard skills with the soft skills. And so I think we as public policymakers need to be more adept at making sure that our curriculum, yes, um, teaches sort of those competencies that are relevant in the job market, math, numeracy, of course, uh, but also is emphasizing those soft skills. And it can be done through the arts. It can be done and introduced into other, other uh, courses and competencies as well. So I think for me, the, the mission as a, as a Minister of Education, I'm responsible from sort of, uh, I have child care as well as kindergarten to grade 12. My colleague, Minister Ross Romano, does sort of advanced education, the post-secondary sector. But it's to encourage more people to get into those jobs. And when you look at sort of from a competitive landscape of our country, we have this bizarre phenomena, this paradox of young people who uh, have in, in our country where you have young people without jobs and jobs without people. We have a skills mismatch in our country. So, you know, it's sort of, sort of hard to believe both could be true, but in this nation, it is very much true, where you have industries that have major vacancies of jobs, and yet you have a massive, you know, twice the average youth unemployment rate of young people don't have the skills to get those jobs. And so we need to do a better job from the public and private sectors collaborating to align those skills so that we give better um, you know, uh, income mobility and better job mobility for young people to move up. Because we have seen stagnation of incomes in this province for, uh, we, right now we have the lowest gro growth of income, at least in 2015 uh, when we were elected, uh, of any province in the country. And I think for a young person, if you work hard, I wanna make sure that you have the ability to rise, raise your incomes, particularly in the context of rising costs. We have a high cost of living, childcare, 
uh, uh, homes are increasingly expensive. So all these things, I think, add up. And so if we're looking at it through that lens of how we align skills, how we incent more people to get into the skilled trades, where we're seeing hundreds of thousands of vacancies as the baby boomers end it. And I think it's important that we, you know, notwithstanding, I don't want to surmise, but if you both went to post-secondary, no doubt, perhaps, went to university. Uh, but, and that's good. We were all supportive. I'm a liberal arts educated. That's wonderful. But we need young people to appreciate the dignity and the financial um, uh, opportunities within the skilled trades, where there are massive gaps in the economy, massive opportunities, and conversely, good-paying jobs. I mean, ostensibly, these are uh, largely entrepreneurial jobs, high skill jobs, we've got a massive gender differential where we have more men than women, but more importantly, we just need more people. I mean, I'm supportive of humans entering the skilled trades. I want more women in that sector, certainly, uh, but we need to destigmatize de that as a job, a viable job for the next generation, because these are not like jobs that maybe of 20, 30, 40 years ago of our parents. These are good paying jobs in addition to increasingly being entrepreneurial, self-employed jobs. So I think if we do that as public policymakers, we're going to help ensure our economy is well balanced, diversified, and set up to succeed in the global marketplace. I am um, before. So just to summarize, yes. so, so uh, in summary, uh, to create the step one is to create more visibility of the diversity and inclusion you already have in the sector by uplifting, let's say, women already in the field to show the next generation um, that they are there. In addition to that, the, the the next one would be to then focus on an integration of skills and uh, crossover in sectors. And thirdly, like you said, um, empowering individuals to um, have be more prepared for the future by um, thinking of alternative pathways as opposed to just thinking university is the only way forward, that there can be some other pathways that they can do, which can be skills trades, can be entrepreneurship, and some of the things that we can get into with our fellow panelists here. Um, and I think that's a very good summary, so thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to excuse myself. I've got to get back to the ministry, but have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank you so much for the opportunity, and best of luck. Thank you. Thank you. That so, gives us a good backdrop. Yeah, to yeah. Talk a lot about. of information. He gave us a lot to talk about. Thank you so much. So, I don't know if I have anything left to say, to be honest. <laughs> so, joining me, uh, joining us today, we have Vivian and Will. Uh, Vivian is a young changemaker from UNESCO, and Will is a Forbes 30 under 30 ed tech entrepreneur. So, both come both from the skill sets we were just talking about, um, but also from the generation that we're looking at solving the gap for. So, I'm very excited to have you. Um, um, based on what we were just talking about, what is your perspective so far on those conversations? You know, I, I think we're, we're due for a, a rescaling revolution, right? When we're looking at the future of work, uh, we are entering what effectively is now the, the fourth um, industrial revolution, which is all about digitization of everything. And uh, coming with that, there's a lot of talks about you know, big data, AI, automation, and, uh, you know, Every time an industrial revolution happens, uh, we see the work sh uh, workforce change dramatically. Right? This, today, it is the first time we have uh, five different generations working together. Right? That's just incredible from a cultural standpoint, from a skill standpoint, and employers uh, will have to end up adapting to that. Right? Uh, but more importantly, I think, uh, the dramatic shift we're, uh, we're going to see uh, is really the, the, the contingent labor, the uh, widening of, of skill gaps, and uh, really the uh, skills uh, obsolescence, right? Because you know, what you're learning today, it may not be what you're going to be using, right, uh, 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 10, 20 years down the road. So uh, I, I think, you know, the minister was, was talking about uh, a McKinsey report. I think I, I've looked up that same report, and it talks about, you know, 10 years from now not that far, a decade from now, 2030, uh, we are going to have 375 million people, right, that are going to be displaced in their current roles, in their current jobs. And that's 14% of the, the, the global workforce, right? So how do you train them or, or what do you do with these people? 
Well, and that's the thing is when we're looking at these gaps, I always, sometimes we get this perspective that it's a one-sided gap, that, oh, it's just the entering generation into the workforce and it's just young people that need to worry about it. But what's interesting about these shifts is it actually has a sandwich effect, which has never been seen before. Usually it's just lower skilled jobs get replaced and we keep going higher skilled. Now the higher skilled jobs are getting replaced. So it's a wake-up call for generations of any age that we need to be upskilling, reskilling, and moving into a lifelong learning generation. Uh, and Vivian, I, what it, based on that, because um, UNESCO is a great kind of add-on to what we were just talking about with the minister, because min the minister is taking kind of like a country perspective, but from like a global perspective, are you seeing similar shifts in strategies, or are you seeing um, a different pr uh, approach to these issues? Yes, thank you very much. No, definitely, I think that what you see in Canada today, you see it globally as well. The minister talked about going back to the basics, you know, numeracy, reading, and we know that globally, more than half of the children worldwide, they're not meeting the minimum learning proficiency standards. That means that more than half of the children worldwide are illiterate. And if they cannot read and they cannot count, how can we expect them to acquire all these new skills that are suddenly thrown upon them, you know? Over here, we talk about coding, about like analytics, and I think Will is an expert on analytics, so I'll let him <laughs> explain what it actually means. But, you know, like, it's so different over in the other countries, and the, the fact is that the UNESCO Institute for Statistics has found out that most of the learning of ICT skills happens in rich countries. So, that really means that there's widening inequalities and we need to tackle it because this is really, to me, the, the main trend that is really worrying and we are really talking about different things right here in Canada and different things over there. Well, and that's um, particularly a point to underscore too because when we're looking at gaps, if we're going to see a rapid uptake and even in ICT fields and things, what that's going to do is create a disparity and widen the inequalities in in the global economy if we're not looking at first to your point giving basically an equal playing field like if you were to if you were to build a if you were to build a tower of lego and i give will all of the, these pre-made lego pieces and everything and i say vivian cut out your pieces and make it out of paper obviously will's going to have the advantage and yeah. so we're not going to be equal so we really have to to your point give the building blocks and look at maybe strategies on how do we, especially for, I think, the multinational companies who do have offices in different parts of the world, are we looking cross, um, kind of cross office of how we're doing skills and strategies that uplift the different offices and communities within those local areas as opposed to um, maybe the head offices where obviously there's more resources. And Will, so Will is going with that, because building on that. Um, so Will, uh, you are founder of Chalk, and Chalk's actually had an interesting um, growth curve, because you started in ed tech, creating kind of tools for educators and teachers, but now you're going really focused on big data. So do you want to just maybe touch on that a bit? Yeah, I mean, without going to, to certainly too much details, you know, I, I, so I, uh, I'm an immigrant to Canada as well. I mean, I'm, frankly, when I arrived, I actually didn't speak a word of English, right? So it's all really my teachers that has inspired me to be who I am. And, uh, you know, Chalk was really originally designed as a uh, suite of uh, tools for teachers uh, and, and it is still that today. In fact, um, uh, we're serving over uh, 400,000 teachers. Uh, I'm proud to be actually in Ontario, partners of uh, Ontario Teachers Federation. Um, but when we look at the bigger opportunity for really education as a whole, it's, you know, how do we, how do we uh, enable data-driven instruction? How do we enable data-driven approach in education? I think many industries were seeing uh, data playing a bigger, bigger role um, we, we, we're asking the same question, right? We're, we're, we're doing the data analytics to help schools understand what exact strategy is working and how do we best uh, utilize our curriculum. Now, that being said, we are very well aware of the effect and impact of really teaching uh, uh, and, and the human element in it, right? Even though I'm a technologist, I'll say this, right? It, it, you can't replace a teacher. You can't replace I agree. Right, that, that human element um, because as you were saying earlier today, Kelly, it is those entrepreneurial, creative thinking, design thinking skills uh, that you gotta teach right, to, to the, the, the 
the students of the next generation. And so when we think about that, you know, how do we blend personalization, using data to really help the teacher, not necessarily to replace the work they're doing, but how do we give them the right information at the right time so that they can uh, really understand where the student is at? Because one thing that stuck with me all this time is, uh, you know, uh, genius is distributed everywhere, but opportunity is now. And I think technology can be a great enabler in that, but it's about how we use it. And then to, to, to close off that comment as well, um, Vivian, from that perspective, how can we, obviously technology can bring some of these skills for those who have internet, and we, that's another conversation of how do we bring digital access so they can learn on their own, because we do have things like Khan Academy and all these things that yeah. create more access to young people in the world that may not have the education systems within their areas. But to Will's point, how can we do that in a way that's effective, that has that human element, that's that motivating and empowering factor that isn't, that can't be done with just a machine? So that's, basically you need a human. And a human <laughs> we is need, we your teacher. Human. <laughs> we need teachers, we need teachers. And I totally agree with what Will said, you know, we cannot replace teachers. Teachers and educators remain central to learning because learning is a human interaction. And, um, but the globally, teachers are not respected. You know, like I don't know what's the case like in Canada, but for most part of the world, we are facing a shortage of motivated and qualified teachers. And this is because also the low status of the teaching profession, as well as the fact that there's no training or inadequate training in many parts of the world for teachers and lack of continuous professional development. So if you're not investing in our teachers, how can we expect them to be teaching our next generations? You know, like they not only have to understand what is going on and acquire these skills, they then have to teach them. I mean, I myself cannot even acquire these new skills, so I really don't think that we should expect so much from teachers. I think that delves right back mm -hmm. into full circle, back into human literacy. Mm -hmm. If we can empower human literacy within everyone, we can become teachers to our kind of a our circles in some sense, if we can empower individuals to be mentors, to share their experiences, almost take on that teacher role, not saying not to fill the shortages oh, of yeah. teachers, but if we can help kind of had that a bit <laughs> with some individuals who can be more, um, be more qualified mentors to their immediate circles, uh, I do believe that we can create a wave that can help with that. Um, and then to summarize, building on what we said in the first part, one, integration, looking at integrated skills, not going one way or another of STEM versus STEAM or arts, but looking at integration. Will, you touched on um, the need for having people and having, seeing, I think, in that way of technology as a tool to connect people, but not replace teachers and people in the process of education. And then three being, um, how do we create access and um, take those solutions to areas um, outside of our backyard to make sure that we're not just upskilling and reskilling the ones who are currently already within the opportunity circle, but how do we expand that circle to include more at the table? Thank you so much for joining me today. I want to also encourage Thank those you. watching online, pipe into this conversation, use the hashtag BTG to youth and share your thoughts on these points. This is only touching the surface layer of all these issues. We can delve so much deeper into this and we can do so online. So uh, please do so and looking forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much.